the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Please be seated. Let me read for you from the Gospel according to Matthew chapter 12 verses 46 to 50. While Jesus was still speaking to the crowds, his mother and his brothers appeared outside, wishing to speak with him. Someone told him, your mother and your brothers are standing outside, asking to speak with you. But he said in reply to the one who told him, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? And stretching out his hand toward his disciples, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. For whoever does the will of my heavenly father is my brother and sister and mother. The Gospel of the Lord. Hallelujah. 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 The Holy Spirit is really moving in our hearts. And that's what we are waiting for. A very fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. There are hearts, there are lives may be molded in the hands of the Lord. And today, this morning, we want our relationships, our family relationships, to be molded in the hands of our God. And I'm sure all of us, all of us here, are praying very much for our children. Because the one concern all of us have is our children. That they should grow up as God's own children, and their future, their life, should be molded in the hands of God. It is in this context that I read for you from the Gospel according to Matthew. A Gospel that is often very much misinterpreted. Jesus was preaching in a certain place. There was a very large gathering. And that's when the mother of Jesus, Mother Mary, and the brothers and sisters of Jesus. And when you say brothers and sisters, you must understand it in the context of the oriental custom. You know, uh, in our language here in Kerala, in Malayalam, uh, we have no word for cousin. I do not know about the other Indian languages. Uh, we have no word for cousin. We call our cousins brothers and sisters. This is the Oriental tradition. You know why? Because we had... Uh, big families and the cousins, uncles all lived together in the, in the united families and therefore traditionally our cousins we called our brothers and sisters and it, it is in that sense that the Bible tells us today the brothers and sisters came to see Jesus and, and they could not go near Jesus. And someone, someone told him, your mother 
your brothers and sisters are waiting to see him outside. And what did Jesus say? Jesus said, who is my mother? Who are my brothers? Who are my sisters? And then pointing to his disciples, Jesus said, here are my mother, my brothers, and my sisters. Then Jesus explained, those who do the will of my heavenly father, they are my mother. They are my brothers. They are my sisters. Hallelujah. 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 What did Jesus mean? There are people who quote this passage to prove that Jesus did not care for his mother. That Jesus did not give importance to his mother. No, it is the opposite. Here, Jesus was giving a great tribute to his mother. A great tribute. Because Jesus was telling them, she became my mother, not merely by a physical act. No. My relationship with my mother, my relationship with my relatives is not a mere physical, natural kinship. Much more, she became my mother since she did the will of my heavenly father. How did Mary become the mother of Jesus? Not by a physical act, no. Mary became the mother of Jesus when Mary surrendered her life in the hands of God. The angel gave her the message that she would conceive and bear a son by the Holy Spirit. And Mother Mary accepted. Here am I. Here am I, your handmaid. Let it be done to me according to your word. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. My dear sisters and brothers, the family relationship is defined by Jesus in a very spiritual, supernatural way. Family relationship is not merely a relationship, a physical and natural relationship. No, much more. Family relationship, kinship is a matter of the spirit. As Mary became my mother, as Mary became my mother, you should become mothers. You should become brothers. You must become sisters by accepting your family, your children from the hands of God. Hallelujah. 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 Defining, defining family relationship in a very high manner, in a spiritual manner. The family united by the will of God, united in prayer. That's what a family is. That's what children are. That's what parents are. Not merely a physical relationship, but a relationship that is animated by the Holy Spirit. My dear sisters and brothers, it is in this context that we must look at our family. Look at our children. And today, Jesus wants to give us an assurance. The assurance that Jesus gave to Jairus. That he will take charge of the future of our children. Jairus came crying. The only daughter was sick and dying. There's a problem. There's a problem with this daughter of sickness. And Jesus took over. Jesus took charge of that problem. And Jesus assured Jairus, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. 
Only belief. What is belief? To believe means to trust. To believe means to let go. To believe means to hand over. Let go of your child. Hand over your child to me. I will take over whatever is gone wrong with your child. I will set it all right. I will take charge. And Jesus did it. Jesus did it. My dear sisters and brothers, this is what we want to do today. To look at our family in the light of faith. Accepting our children, the members of our family, from the hands of God. Let me share with you an experience of mine. I have shared this before. Uh, I'm sure some of you have heard of my testimony. But I want to say it again because that's where I want to start. I was just four years old, a little kid. At one time, I was a kid, you know, a little kid, four years old. And my mother said to me, my son, let's go for adoration. I did not know what adoration was. I asked my mother, mom, where are we going? My mother said, my son, let's go to see Jesus. Ah, that I loved. That I loved because I knew who Jesus was. Every day, sitting in the lap of my mother, in the warmth of love, I used to hear beautiful stories of Jesus. How Jesus created me. How Jesus loved me. How important, how precious I was for Jesus. How she received me from the hands of Jesus. How Jesus was always there for me. I should not say even a bad word that would offend Jesus. We are here on this earth to please Jesus. We are going back to Jesus. Beautiful things about Jesus. And I thought Jesus was a big fellow. That's how children think of God, right? That Jesus was a big fellow. So when my mother said, let's go to see Jesus, I was excited. Excited because I thought I was going to see that big fellow. We went to the church, the frame church, a big church. The 40 hours adoration was going on in those days. My mother and I, we went inside the church. My mother knelt in the middle of the church. I was standing in front of her, looking around. The church was beautifully decorated. Colorful flowers and a lot of bulbs and decorations. I was looking around, very distracted. At one moment, my mother touched my shoulder and said to me, my son, don't be distracted. Look at the altar. I asked her, Mom, what is there on the altar? My mother said, My son, Jesus is there. I was excited because I thought I was going to see that big fellow. I was excited. I asked my mother, Mom, where is Jesus? My mother pointed out to me, My son, Look at the altar. You see those big bouquets on the altar? I said, yes, mom. I can see those colorful flowers on the altar. My son, you see those lighted candles? I said, yes, mom. I can see those big lighted candles. In the middle, my son, you see a golden monstrance? I said, yes, mom. I can see that golden monstrance. In the center of that monstrance, my son, you see a white piece of bread. I said, yes, ma'am, I can see that white piece of bread. Then my mother said, my son, 
it is not bread it is jesus when my mother said it is jesus i noted the special tone in her voice i began to look I began to look at the altar at the white piece of bread at the monstrance I began to look at the bulbs and colors and and candles i looked in front of the altar i looked by the side of the altar because i was looking for jesus i thought that big fellow would come there nobody came there i saw flowers i saw candles i saw the white piece of bread i did not see jesus i wanted to ask my mother mom where is jesus i turned and looked at the face of my mother but when i looked at the face of my mother i could not ask anything to her by the time the face of my mother was so changed the face of my mother was glowing her eyes were glowing her eyes were focused on the altar i was looking at her she was not even seeing me her eyes were focused on the altar and the face you know the face of my mother was always beautiful but at that moment i thought there was a heavenly glow heavenly beauty on the face of my mother my little heart began to tell me my mother saw jesus my mother saw jesus that's why her face is glowing but my mother said this right it is not bread it is jesus it should be jesus my mother saw him that's why her face is so glowing i could not ask anything to her i turned to the altar i looked at the white piece of bread the sacred host and i saw jesus i saw jesus on the strength of the word of my mother i called him jesus my mother took my little hands into her big palms and whispered into my ears jesus i love you i repeated that prayer after her jesus i love you i stood there for a long time for a long time i stood there looking at the face of jesus and telling him jesus i love you a very sacred experience in my heart and shrined in my heart an experience that my mother gave me well i grew up i wanted to become a priest i joined the seminary i studied philosophy and theology i was ordained a priest later i was sent to rome for my higher studies i came back with my big degrees but even today as a priest at the altar when i take the sacred host in my hands it is not my philosophy it is not my theology it is not my degrees that tell me it is jesus but the gentle voice of my mother whispering to my heart my son jesus philosophy and theology have arguments arguments always have counter arguments but the gentle tender voice of my mother 
had no counter argument. In that tender age, my mother lit the lamp of faith in my heart. The lamp is still burning, burning, giving me the warmth and the light of faith. 42 years, I am a priest. I must tell you, I am a happy priest because because of my mother I love Jesus I have given my heart and my life to him because of my mother my mother has pointed my Jesus to me a few years ago my mother died her dead body was laid up in my house. I said the final prayers. According to the custom in this place, at the end of the funeral prayers, I took a wreath of flowers. I placed it on the head of my mother, praying, may, may the Lord crown you in eternity. I looked at the face of my mother, I was seeing the face of my mother for the last time. I did not feel sad. But I was filled with gratitude. I was filled with love. This is the face that taught me to pray. This is a face that brought me to Jesus. And even then, I could see that glow, the glow I saw when I was four years old, that glow on the face of my mother. I'm sure today, in eternity, the face of my mother is glowing in the presence of God. You know, my dear sisters and brothers, one thing we shall know, the one purpose, the one purpose for which God has given you children is to bring them to Jesus. We want to give the best to our children, right? The best of education, the best of prosperity, the best of a job. But after having given them all the comforts of the world, after having given them all the education of this world, if you have not given them the comfort of faith in Jesus, they will remain distressed for the rest of their life. After having educated them big, if you have not taught them to pray, they are illiterate. They are illiterate. Even today, life is hard for us, right? Life is tough for us. There are problems. Tomorrow, when our children are going to grow up, life is going to be tougher. Life is going to be harder. And they will face problems. Waves. Waves rolling up against them. And then they should remember, when my mother, when my father, when they were facing problems, they held on to each other and prayed. In prayer, they got the strength to face all the challenges, all the problems of life. They will learn to pray. They will learn to pray because of beautiful memories of prayer, beautiful memories of prayer that you have given them. They will learn to live. They will learn to face the challenges of life. The one thing that makes you a mother, makes you a father, the one mission you have as a mother, as a father, is to bring them to Jesus, to point out Jesus to them in the warmth of your lap. Your children shall learn to pray, shall learn to talk to Jesus and live 
for Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My dear sisters and brothers, we must make a very honest soul searching. Very honest soul searching. What memories am I leaving in the heart of my children? What memories am I living in the hearts, in the heart of my children? A father and mother always caring for each other, understanding each other, always helping each other, encouraging each other. Is that the memory you are leaving in the minds of your children? Well, you have won your children for Jesus. You have taught them to live, to succeed in a tough world. But if you are living in the hearts of your children, memories of a father and mother fighting with each other all the time, a father and mother challenging each other all the time a father and mother blaming each other all the time if such are the memories you are living in the minds of your children you have lost your children your children have lost their future because you did not carry out the responsibilities the mission given to you by the Lord, you have failed your children. You have failed Jesus. Today, the one prayer we should have, the prayer for our children, whatever mistakes we may have done, whatever failures we may have committed against our children, that they may be able to be healed with the love of God. Hallelujah. 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 As parents, we are not able to understand each other. As parents, we are not able to accept each other. There are problems, there are financial difficulties, there are tensions in our marriage. How do we face them? Stories told of a couple, elderly couple, Joe and Anne. Joe began to have a doubt. My wife, Anne, perhaps she's not able to hear. She's not hearing many things that I'm saying. But then Joe did not want to ask Anne because he did not want to hurt her. So Joe went to a doctor, a friend of his, and told him, you know, doctor, my wife has got a problem. She cannot hear. She does not hear many things that I'm saying. How to test? How to test this? How much she can hear? Shall I bring her to your clinic? The doctor said, Joe, that may not be needed. This is an easy way to test how much your wife can hear. When your wife is turning uh, to the wall, perhaps in the kitchen, uh, cooking, busy cooking. You stand behind, 10 feet behind, and say something. Naturally, your wife won't hear. You come closer, say five feet, and say the same thing. Your wife may not hear. You come still closer. And then you would know how much your wife will be able to hear. And Joe thought one day he would test. Saturday evening, um, Joe stood 10 feet away. Wife Anne was cooking, busy cooking. And um, Joe stood 10 feet behind and said something. What are we having today for supper? Well, Anne did not hear. So Joe came closer, five feet, 
and asked, and what are we having for dinner today? And did not hear. Three feet. And even then, and did not hear. Then Joe came very close, stood right behind Anne, and asked her, Anne, what are we having for dinner today? And Anne said, Joe, I have been telling you four times. We are having rice and chicken today for dinner. So who could not hear? Who could not hear? Joe or Anne. Now who is clapping? Husbands or wives? <laughs> My dear sisters and brothers, often the mistakes we find in the other could be our own mistakes. And we are human beings. There are troubles. There are problems. Stories told of a, of a man. He would come to the church every morning, attend the mass, and go to the cemetery. Go to the cemetery and go near a tomb and shed tears and, and begin to wail. Oh, why did you do this to me? Why had you to go so early? Because you went so early, you made my life miserable. Oh, I'm so sad. My life is so miserable because you went so early. Why had you go so early? Another man saw this and asked him, um, your wife left, died eh, long ago. And why are you so sad? You're so sad. And the man said, no, that's the tomb of the first husband of my wife. You did not get it, did you? <laughs> Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. My dear sisters and brothers, there are problems. Problems are bound to be there because we are limited, sinful human beings. Problems are bound to be there. But when there is a misunderstanding, when there's a problem, when there's a failure in your life, how do you face it? How do you respond to it? The way Mother Mary did. John chapter 2. John chapter 2. There was a problem in the family at Cana. At Cana, there was a terrible problem. The marriage banquet was going on. For Jewish marriages, wine was a very important item. Because wine was the symbol of love. If tasty wine was served, everybody would taste the wine, would drink the wine, and say, oh, gorgeous wine. And they would bless the couple saying, wonderful wine you gave us. So wonderful will be the love in your marriage. That's what everybody wanted. The guests to drink wine, to enjoy the wine and then bless the couple. So wine was a very precious item to be served during the banquet. Wine shall never fail. If wine failed, it would be considered a bad omen. And therefore, everyone took care and provided for more than sufficient wine for all to drink and make merry at Cana, the failure. The failure of calculation. Wine jars became empty. Nobody knew where to turn to. I'm sure there was a look, embarrassing look of blaming each other. Why did this happen? Soon everybody would come to know. There will be a problem here. A marriage before it started would be in failure. And Mother Mary knew this. Mother Mary knew this. What did Mother Mary do? She did not blame anyone. She did not blame anyone. She brought the problem to Jesus 
they have no wine and then she turned the whole family to jesus do what he tells you to the whole family the whole family was prepared to do the will of jesus and that's when the miracle took place the miracle took place water was turned to wine the family was saved hallelujah till all of us raise our hands up and say hallelujah hallelujah, hallelujah. thank you jesus praise you jesus my dear sisters and brothers when there is a problem when there is a failure when there is a misunderstanding in your family miracles should take place and miracles will take place miracles will take place when you do what mother mary tells you to bring your problem to jesus bring that failure to jesus bring that disaster to jesus our god is a god of miracles and god said it my hands are not shortened that i cannot save you my heart is not grown dull that i cannot answer your prayer god said it god is a god of miracles waiting to intervene waiting to intervene into our troubles our failures our problems but we must keep our hearts open we must keep our hearts open when there is a problem we must come together we must come together and pray your bedroom your bedroom must become a room of prayer where the two of you my brother my sister the husband and wife the two of you you come together in prayer to offer in the hands of the lord every problem of the day every failure every disaster everything whatever you are afraid of bring it all to jesus and wait mother mary will be interceding for you mother mary will be interceding for you bring it all to jesus and wait for god's intervention for miracles to happen but then what do we do when there is a problem what do we do when there is a problem we blame each other right we blame each other the children fail in the exam immediately the wife would blame the husband the husband would blame the wife there's a problem there's a prob financial problem immediately the husband will say you you were not careful you were not careful to um to spend the money now look at this there's a problem and the wife would blame the husband i have been telling you all the time go and get a better job because you are not trying to get a better job there's no money in the house that's why there's a problem and then the husband would say i should have married a woman with a job the failure my mistake is my marriage i married a woman with a job the only income in the family is my earning how can how can today a family survive with the earning of one person we blame each other when we blame each other what happens the devil enters the devil enters the devil enters into our relationship we become depressed we become angry we become bitter and st paul said it so clearly ephesians chapter 4 ephesians chapter 4 verse 26 get angry we are bound to get angry we are bound to get angry we are bound to be disturbed we are bound to fail the other the expectations of the other we are bound to face challenges but then st paul is warning us such a failure such a distress such an anger should not become an opportunity should not become an opportunity for devil to enter into your heart 
Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. No problem in your family. No disaster in your family. No failure in your family should be an opportunity for the devil to enter. Why does the devil come in? John 10.10. 10. John 10.10. 10. The devil comes in to destroy, to plunder, and to kill. How many families are destroyed? How many families are plundered by the evil power? Because you did not know how to solve your problems. You did not know in prayer how to wait for God to step in and do a miracle. Know this, my dear sisters and brothers. At the moment of your failure, at the moment of your problem, God is waiting. God is waiting to do a miracle. When there's a problem, as Mother Mary thought, the wine failed. Mother Mary knew that's not the end of the world. No. There's a way out. And the way is Jesus. And Jesus said it, I'm the way. I'm the way. The way is Jesus. And you must be able to pray with Mother Mary in the moments of your problems, waiting for Jesus to step in, Jesus to do a miracle, to save a family. Haven't you said everything is gone wrong? God should do a miracle to save a family. If a miracle is needed, a miracle will be done. But you must wait in prayer as the servants and handmaids of the Lord, as Mother Mary did. A problem in the life of Mother Mary, she was to conceive and bear a son. She did not know how. She could be stoned to death. She was not living with a man yet. How could she conceive and bear a son? Too many, too many disasters. Too many things going wrong and yet, but Mary became a servant. Here am I, your servant, your handmaid. Let it be done to me according to your word. A husband and wife should become servants and handmaids of God. Bring the problem in your upper room, in your bedroom, a room of prayer. You must offer every problem and prayer, becoming servants a servant, a handmaid of the Lord, ready to do God's will. Who is a servant? A servant is a person ready to listen to God's voice, to do God's will. Learn to pray together. Your problems and your failures and your disasters should become occasions of prayer when you come together hold on to each other and pray offering it to God waiting for God to intervene a real event of a great saint a great saint John Neumann the first American saint John Neumann John Neumann was the Bishop of Philadelphia. And later he was canonized. Today he's a saint, John Neumann. John Neumann has written his autobiography. And there he says how he became a saint. The secret of his sainthood was a lie. That is said, a lie. That's where everything started. A lie that is said. He made a mistake as a little child. As a little child, he made a mistake. And the father of John Neumann, the father called the son and asked him, my son, did you do that mistake? And the son said, no. I did not do that mistake. The son knew it was a lie. The father also knew it was a lie. And how did the father 
respond to that lie? John Neumann says, I said the lie. I was feeling guilty for having said the lie. But then when I looked at the face of my dad, I could see the face of my dad turning red. The eyes of my dad turning blood red and tears welling up in the eyes of my dad, tears flowing down. At one moment, my dad broke down crying and he took, his, he took both his palms and covered his face, the boy. John, he could not stand there. He could not stand the tears of his dad. He ran away. After some time, the dad opened his eyes, looked for the son. The son was not there. The dad went around calling him, John, my son, where are you? John was hiding in the corner of a room. The dad went there and held John close to him and said to him, John, my son, I wept. Not because of your mistake, no. I wept because of my mistake. Your mistake of saying a lie was first my mistake. I said, Dad, I failed. I failed to bring you up. I failed to bring you up as a godly child who would never say a lie. If you said that lie, it is my mistake, my failure. I failed to bring you up as a child of God who would never say a lie. When God gave you to me and your mother, you were an angel. See what I have done. See what I have done with the life of an angel. I made you a liar. It's my mistake. My son, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for making you a liar. And John says, after that, I could never say a lie. I could never say a lie. When there would be an opportunity to say a lie, I would remember the tears rolling down the face of my dad, the redness in the eyes of my dad. I would never be able to say a lie. John became a saint. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. My dear sisters and brothers, what is happening in our families? There are mistakes in our children, in the wife, in the husband. There are mistakes. But how did you respond to it? I blame the other. When I blame the other, the devil is right there. The devil is right there. When did Adam begin to blame his wife Eve? When the devil entered, right? When the devil entered, Adam and Eve allowed the devil to enter into their life. That's when Adam blamed his wife. Adam said, oh God, not I, not I. The woman you gave me, she's the cause of it. The devil was right there to destroy the first marriage. What did Jesus do to save us? Jesus did not blame anyone. Atrocities were done to him. He did not blame anyone. He did not blame Pilate. He did not blame Judas. He did not blame Peter. He did not blame the soldiers. He did not blame the centurion. 
he prayed for them. Father, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. When a wife does a mistake, when a husband does a mistake, when the children do a mistake, the whole family must be able to come together in prayer to accept the mistake and offer it as Jesus did in the hands of the Heavenly Father. And God will take charge of our mistakes. God will take charge of our mistakes. You don't have to beat up your children because they did a mistake. You don't have to shout at your wife because she did a mistake. Come together in your bedroom as a family every day. Offer every problem, every failure, every mistake in the hands of Jesus to the Heavenly Father. God will take charge. For a miraculous intervention of God, our families will be saved. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus. When you do it, you are leaving wonderful memories. Wonderful memories in the hearts of your children. Memories of love, of reconciliation, memories of understanding. Let's all stand up. <clears throat> My dear sisters and brothers, we have much to ask pardon from God. We have much to learn. We have much to learn how to lead a family life. How to lead our relationship. Our relationship that is salvific. Let us learn it from Mother Mary. Let's ask Mother Mary to be part of our family. She's given to us as our mother. Here is your mother, Jesus said to John. John was in tears. When we are in tears, when we are in distress, hold on to Mother Mary. Learn from Mother Mary to make our families a paradise. Even mistakes and failures and disasters should become opportunities of prayer, of God's interventions. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Jesus.